Julio and White in 1901 was a quite tragic case in which the claimant was a pregnant woman who was working behind the bar at her husband's pub when a horse and carriage suddenly crashed into the pub and the woman feared for her life and the life of her unborn child in that moment. She wasn't touched by the carriage, she was not physically injured, but she did suffer a grave amount of um, psychiatric shock and as a result she gave birth prematurely and the child had severe developmental problems. In this case it was held that damages resulting from nervous shock due to fright can be recoverable in an action for negligence even if there was no physical um, touch or contact between the victim um, and the horse and carriage there was still a very real physical ailment suffered by Mrs. Julio and personally I, I agree with its outcome I don't see why someone should be able to get away with hurting or causing damage to someone else um, even if there was no physical contact. I think it is the correct outcome. The case of Hinson Berry is quite similar to that of Julia and White in its facts. In this case Mr and Mrs Hinson took their four children and four foster children on a day out they stopped to have a picnic by the side of the road. Mr. Hinst was inside of the family van making some tea. The children were playing. Mrs. Hinst took one of her children across the, the road to pick some flowers and she was turned away when a motorist crashed into the van where Mr. Hinst was making tea, unfortunately. He suffered serious injuries. He died as a result of his injuries. And up, upon hearing the crash, Mrs. Hinst turned around to witness this tragic scene of her husband um, bleeding out on the, side, on the side of the road. Seeing this shocking scene led her to have really serious psychiatric um, illnesses. She experienced morbid depression and postpartum depression. She was pregnant at the time of the crash and she said that she could not bear to look at her posthumous child since it reminded her so much of her dead husband. Prior to the crash, Mrs. Hintz had been a happy woman. She lived to take care of her children. She um, was described as being courageous and full of life. And after the crash, she was completely depressed. Her um, physician said that she was feeling suicidal, she displayed signs of suicidal illness and the court awarded her £4,000 for her psychiatric illnesses caused as a result of having witnessed this, sh this um, scene, this tragic scene that gave her so much shock. The defendant very appealed this decision saying that £4,000 was much too high a figure to award a widow for her grief and the court stated that in fact it was not for the grief it was for the severe psychiatric illness she sustained for having been witness to such a tragic crash of her husband. Um, I agree with this decision I think that psychiatric illness is a very real condition that should be treated and um, that damages should be awarded just as much as if it were a physical um, illness if Mrs Hins had been also involved in the crash and survived her husband no one would have questioned her claim to damages Hicks is a case that deals with parents of two sisters Sarah and Victoria Hicks, who were 19 and 15, respectively, at the time of their deaths in the Hillsborough Stadium. They were crushed to death and their parents were making a claim against the defendant on the basis of the fear that the sisters must have felt at the time of their death. It was actually held in this case that 
they could not be awarded damages as they had not effectively proved that the sisters suffered any injuries. The parents appealed this decision, but they were unsuccessful and the appeal was dismissed. This is one of those cases that is quite hard to reconcile morally. I do agree with the legal decision, as I feel that they could have been um, a sort of uh, floodgates opening instance here. But it's quite difficult to say in such tragic um, instances where public interest is so large that the parents should get no damages for the fear that their daughters would have felt. It's kind of a sense of lacking or missing justice here. Alcock was a joint action brought by Alcock and several others who all had relatives who died at the Hillsborough disaster. Some of them had been present at the scene when it happened and some of them had watched the coverage of their relatives on TV. They were all claiming damages for the psychiatric harm as a result of having to watch such a tragic scene. Um, it was actually held that only a primary victim would be owed a duty of care and secondary victims would have to meet certain criteria. Um, which were having a close tie of love and affection to a primary victim, um, having an appreciation of the event with unaided senses, uh, proximity to the event or its immediate aftermath, and to have had psychiatric harm caused by a sufficiently shocking event. I do agree with this with this ruling, uh, so I think. Any other, um, any other result would have opened the floodgates too much once again. And although it may seem harsh to deny someone compensation or damages after having witnessed such a tragic event, it, you can kind of see the, the reasoning. For example, if someone had watched their relative die on the television, you can always say that they had that choice to turn it off. Um, although I don't know how many of us could just um, could do that if it was our relatives involved. White and others was a case in which police officers sought to bring an action of negligence against their employer, the chief constable for the psychiatric harm which they suffered due to having um, been witnesses to the Hillsborough disaster firsthand. The issue here was whether there was a duty of care to protect them from psychiatric harm and were the police officers primary victims in this case. It was held that there was no duty of care to protect from psychiatric harm, only physical harm. And it was also found that they were only secondary victims. This is quite a confusing case for me, and I'm not sure if I fully understand it yet. And I do agree and disagree with this with this finding. I can see on one hand how people might think that police officers sign up to witness tragic scenes as part of their job. It's somewhat expected that a police officer would see some distressing scenes um, but also when it comes to something like the Hillsborough disaster I think that could be treated differently there's, um, there's a difference between the daily scenes that a police officer might see you know threatening um, people criminals and such such things and there's a uh, and I think the Hillsborough disaster was on a different scale. So I do think it could be quite an unfair um, thing to say that they were just secondary victims and they don't deserve any damages for the psychiatric harm they suffered. At the end of the day, they still suffered psychiatric harm. And I think they should be awarded something in compensation for that.
claimants in this case were foster parents to teenage children and they had also four children of their own. They were looking to um, have another child placed with them and they made it explicitly clear to both the council and the social worker that they didn't want any children to be placed with them who had a history of sexual abuse or were suspected of sexual abuse. Um, after this, a 15-year-old child was placed in that home who went on to sexually abuse the couple's children. Now, both the parents and the children suffered, sec uh, suffered um, psychiatric harm and psychiatric illness due to this abuse. And they were claiming damages for these psychiatric injuries. The Court of Appeal allowed the claims on behalf of the children, but they dismissed the parents as secondary victims. This decision was not agreed upon by the House of Lords, and the House of Lords allowed the parents' appeal. I agree with this decision. I think um, the House of Lords uh, stated very, very accurately what the parents must have felt, which is a great sense of guilt for having let this abuser, sexual abuser, into their home and having subjected their children to this abuse. And I think that must cause a great deal of psychiatric harm to the parents um, in their own respect. Obviously, the children's psychiatric harm is evident, but I think parents need to be considered as well as primary victims. So I do completely agree with this, with this finding. In Sion and Hampstead Health Authority, the claimant's son was seriously injured in a motoring accident and was taken to hospital where the staff failed to notice that he was bleeding from his kidney. He was he fell into a coma um, some days after the accident, having suffered a heart attack. He deteriorated in condition and he died some days later in the intensive care unit. Now the father's son had stayed at his son's um, bedside throughout the whole ordeal and he claimed that the hospital's negligent care of his son had caused him to suffer psychiatric harm and injury. The hospital um, applied to have the claim struck, citing no cause of action. And the judge found for the hospital upon which the claimant appealed, and this appeal was dismissed. Um, I agree with this decision. I, as tragic as the event was, I don't think there was any real shock in this situation from which you could say that the psychiatric injuries stemmed from. In this case, the father didn't witness the accident, neither did he witness the, the rapid deterioration of his son's health. He did witness the deterioration, but it went on for days and weeks even. So I don't think there was any real shock in this scenario, as tragic and unfortunate as it was. Spartan Steel and Martin and Co. I quite enjoyed reading this case. It was less tragic than the others. And it dealt with the defendants who were responsible for digging up a road outside of the, um, the plaintiff's factory and due to their negligence in carrying out the task they somehow cut off the power supply um, under the road which meant that the whole factory was out of power and they couldn't produce any more um, metal I think they were producing. And the issue at hand was whether the plaintiff the plaintiffs could um, recover damages for the loss of profits, or whether this was not recoverable in negligence, as it was um, pure economic loss. 
the court found that even where a plaintiff is owed a duty of care in respect to physical damage to property, any pure economic loss suffered in addition to the physical damage is not recoverable, which meant that the claimant could recover um, damages for the metal that was wasted or damaged due to um, the metal making process being cut short by the the power outage that they could recover but any losses um, in regards to the metal that they could have produced and then went on to say to, to sell um, they could not recover damages for so it was only the metal that was affected directly because of the power outage not the metal that they could have produced if they had had power um i agree with this decision on on one hand i do think it's very logical from a legal standpoint i think if i was a business owner i would be quite upset by this decision um obviously if you don't have any power that's going to be an extra added expense for you you can't produce anything you can't sell anything therefore and you can't make any profit and you have no way of recovering damages for this profit that you've lost but i do see how legally it makes sense there's no way to prove that you could have sold that metal if you had had power so i do think it was the right decision but it could be an infuriating one for a business owner Headley Byrne deals again with the concept of pure economic loss. In this case, Headley Byrne was a company looking to give a line of credit to another company, Easy Power, and they went to Easy Power's bank in order to um, get a reference to see if um, they should, in fact, give this credit to Easy Power. Um, the bank said, yes, you can give this uh, line of credit to them but uh, they included a very important clause when giving this reference that they didn't have any, that there was no responsibility on the part of the bank or the bank's officials. Um, Headley Byrne relied on the bank's reference, gave the line of credit to Easy Power, and they were then responsible for all of the financial loss when the the company Easy Power went into liquidate liquidation. Um, the court found that uh, the bank's disclaimer of no responsibility did protect them from any liability in this case, so the claim failed. However, it was a very important case for the whole concept of pure economic loss that we saw in Scion just before this. And the House of Lords found the House of Lords found that um, pure economic loss could be found, considering that four conditions were met: that uh, a relationship, a monetary relationship of trust and confidence exists or arises between two parties; that the party preparing the reference or advice or information has voluntarily assume the risk that there has been a reliance on this advice or information by the other party and that such reliance was reasonable in the circumstances. Now all of these except um, the second condition would have been met in this case and um, that is why I think that's how I understand that the claim did not succeed. But it was a very important case for establishing um, pure economic loss, I believe. Merit and Bab was quite a confusing case for me. Um, as I understand it, 
Fahab was an employee of a firm of surveyors who negligently carried out a survey of um, a residential property owned by a mother and ought to be bought by a mother and her daughter. Um, the claimants paid Bab's employer, but they never met Bab himself. Could the employee be personally liable for the negligent survey as a result of this? Um, it was held that the liability was allowed, seeing as um, Bab knew that the mother and daughter would be relying on his advice and he signed the survey personally. However, in this particular case, I don't think the mother wanted um, to seek any damages and she was not a part of the proceedings, so only um, half of the damages were awarded, I believe. Um, I agree with this ruling, I think, but I'm still quite confused by it, so I think I need to do some further reading to completely understand. But it seems fair to me that if an employee knows that people are going to be making financial decisions based upon his advice, that he should be personally liable if he makes a negligent, um, if he provides negligent advice. It only seems rational that that should be the case. In Bacargill City Council is a really, really interesting case from New Zealand. I really enjoyed reading it um, because the judges make a lot of, they have a lot of discussion about the differences between British customs and law and the development of um, New Zealand law. It deals with a homeowner, Hamlin, who built and purchased a house maybe 20 years ago prior to the case and he at the time of the house's building he invited the council to do the home inspection to make sure everything was as it should be as was the custom in New Zealand. The council um, carried out the building inspection they signed off on it and said it was fine but uh, some 17 18 years later Hamlin started noticing cracks in the house's foundation and he hired a builder who then um, noticed that the house was not built properly, the foundations were not properly laid, and that the um, original inspector should have noticed this, really. So Hamlin wanted to bring an action against the council for the damages, the cost of the reparation for his house. Um, there was an issue of whether he could bring, even bring this claim, seeing as it was such a long time after, um, after the initial event of the inspection. But the High Court found the council liable and awarded damages of $53,550. Um, the council unsuccessfully appealed this decision um, to the Court of Appeal as well as the Privy Council. Um, the judge found that it was unreasonable for Hamlin to have detected um, the flaws in the foundation any prior to when he, when he did and for this reason he was awarded the damages. I agree with this decision. I think it was the most fair and um, rational decision that could have been made. Vaughan Men Love was a really interesting case that dealt with an objective standard in negligence and in this case the defendant placed a stack of hay near some cottages owned by the claimant he was warned that they might set on fire and decided to just take his chances with it. Eventually they did set on fire and burnt down the claimant's cottages. Um, after which the claimant sought to recover their value. 
Um, it was held that um, the, there is a standard of, there is an objective standard um, in negligence. And even though the defendant said that he didn't know any better, how could he? Um, this was not enough. His best judgment was not enough and it had to be judged by the standard of a reasonable man. I agree with this finding um, in this instance, but I also think it might be, uh, it could be a slippery slope in some instances. Obviously not everyone has the same access to education and whilst the standard of a reasonable man, reasonable man might seem just that um, reasonable, it does seem quite dangerous in certain instances. However, I think as a general rule, it works very well and I agree with it in this case.